Hi, thanks for the intro. I'm Lily, and I wanted to delve a little bit into the idea of what open means, generally speaking, when we talk about it. Um, I know that right now we are at the Open Knowledge Miniconf, um, and there's a lot of things that are associated with the idea of open in this space. There's open knowledge, obviously, open technology, open education, and most of us here are probably working in or around one or a mixture of these. There are lots of expressions of this particular nexus. Um, as Steve was just talking about, we have open government data sets, GovHack type initiatives where people can take all of this sort of stuff and mix it together, probably sitting somewhere around here. Um, there are things like academic research, open journals, that kind of thing, where you've got research that is no longer hidden behind a paywall, available to anybody to take, use, build on, work off, whatever you want, probably sitting somewhere around there. Things like the Wikimedia Foundation, stuff like that, probably a bit of everything, and every, everyone sits sort of on this spectrum somewhere, to greater or lesser extent. Um, so one of my passions is right at this hub also, and one of the ways that I found to express this is to focus on open learning initiatives. There are lots of these also. Um, just off the top of my head, thinking about things like Coursera, where you can go and sign up and learn things for free. That's open in some senses of the word. Meetup.com and attending meetups like that is open in certain other senses of the word. There are lots of different ways of interpreting this. So basically, the idea of open education, open knowledge, open technology, this is not exactly new. But what I want to think about is what this means and what could it mean or should it mean um, if we get the best possible outcome from these ideas applied to this field. I think it's a fairly safe assumption that when we get into open knowledge, open source technology, open education, et cetera, et cetera, we do this because we want people, generally, to have knowledge, to take it, use it, and, and just generally to be aware of it. But what do we mean by open? Firstly, there's the sense that's united most of us here, which is this idea of free, libre, open, where things are shareable, editable, reusable in many different ways, in many different forms, with or without attribution, lots of different senses to that. But I wonder what open means in other contexts. One of them that I like to focus on is removing as many barriers to entry as possible um, in every sense that I can think of it. And I started off life as a QA, so I can think of this in a lot of different ways. <laughs> um, but to me, creating diversity here starts with accessibility. And I believe that this definition up here needs to apply to anything that's calling itself open. And the best way that I can illustrate my own experience with this is through the story of my invo involvement with the Open Tech School. There are a couple of people here who work with me on the Open Tech School. Got Angus, hi, and Matt down here as well. I'm sorry if I can't see anyone else. But um, to give you a little background of what the Open Tech School is, I didn't start it. <laughs> None of us here did. It started off in Berlin in 2012. It came out of the Rails Girls idea where People were teaching Ruby on Rails to women, free workshops, come along and, and just get started with the basics of programming. And a bunch of people got together afterwards and thought, this is an excellent idea. What we really love to do is take this idea and use it for not just Ruby, but lots of different programming languages and lots of different technologies. And to focus not just on women, but lots of different kinds of people from all different walks of life, from all different sorts of backgrounds everywhere and make it as open as we can. So the idea was to teach programming of all kinds in a non-judgmental environment with a focus on beginners. There are a lot of workshops online. Our most popular one is the Python workshop. We also teach not only programming languages, but concepts and ways of programming, things like how Git works. We've got a workshop for that, lots of stuff. I got involved with the Melbourne chapter in 2013 as a student at one of their Python workshops. And I loved it so much that I came back the next time it was running to try and coach it. I was pretty nervous, but I gave it my best shot. And I've been involved in coaching and organizing it ever since then. Started working professionally in the IT industry. And, and I love it. And it turns out a lot of other people love it too. <laughs> We've grown. Lots of people like this idea. 
Starting off in Berlin, as you can see, we now have chapters in lots of different places in Germany, in Israel, we've got one in Nairobi, uh, we've got some in the US, the UK, and one up the road in Melbourne. There are some ideas that the Open Tech School embraces that I think are really useful for all kinds of open endeavors. In the sense I was just talking about it. Firstly, empowerment. This means getting everyone in, encouraged, feeling encouraged to be involved at all levels, whether they're beginners, whether they have some programming experience because they're interested in data, but they haven't, they're not necessarily programmers themselves. Um, students becoming teachers, as I did, pathways through to coaching, because one of the best ways to cement knowledge is, we believe, to teach it yourself. So we encourage people to do that as well. Uh, and another thing is creating a really welcoming learning environment. This means a place where all questions are valid. There's no such thing as a stupid question. We have beginner questions, but none of them are wrong or weird. And we're trying to cater for as much one-on-one -on -one attention as we possibly can. This means that if we have a workshop where 20 people turn up, we try to have at least one coach for every three to four people so that if someone's got a question, they can have it addressed in a face-to-face -face manner as much as possible. Another thing we're looking at trying to do as much as we can is transparency. This means that we are providing people with the tools to set up their own workshops, in which, which is how we've grown so far across the world. People just sort of take this and use it. Um, encouraging people to learn from what we do well and the times we mess up and how we can learn from those mistakes. And while this isn't possible for everybody in every situation, another thing that we really strive to be is nonprofit. This means that everything we do is never commercial. Certainly, we are open to the idea of sponsorship, but we never try and turn a profit off of this. And everybody who comes and runs it is a volunteer because we believe that people who are coming and doing it are best when they're bringing their passion for it and not because they're being paid necessarily. <laughs> and openness. So part of this is open in the free Libre sense, where we've got a Creative Commons license for all of our workshop materials. Uh, we have translated as many of our workshops as we can, especially the Python one being the most popular, into lots of different languages. Currently, it exists in English, German, Spanish, Korean, Russian, and Romanian. And we're trying to translate as many of these as we can, but of course, because it's an open source effort and requires certain skills, this takes time. So it's, it's rolling out very slowly as the community needs it, generally. But we'd like to see as many languages as we can. Another thing that we're trying to do is run workshops in many different places. Most of these have so far been, in, for us in Melbourne at any rate, central to the city. This is because this tends to be the easiest for everybody to get to. But I'd really like to see us running some further out, having chapters and pockets in suburbs where people can turn up if, they, if it's easier for them to get to, say, Craigieburn in Melbourne or get out here to Geelong, rather than coming all the way into the Melbourne CBD, then this is something that we would really like to try. We tried Reddit. Um, and this was part of our attempt to access a few new demographics. Normally, we operate through, through meetup.com, like many of us here have probably experienced going to a meetup. Um, and our experiences here were positive from this experiment. We were prepared for the, a certain amount of trolling. We didn't get any. We got a fairly decent response for something that we decided to try out the night before. That was awesome. Lots of enthusiasm and lots of people coming and saying, I really wish I'd heard about this earlier, which is, which is you know, on us. We're trying, we'll try again next time. But we did get a few new people turning up. And that was really great. That meant that we had some new experiences, some new people, some new, new perspectives. That was awesome. Um, and uh, in addition to experimenting with advertising, we're trying to experiment with workshop formats. Locally, we've traditionally run workshop type things with uh, self-driven focus. So we put all of our material up online. People go and look at it. They work their way through it step by step. We've also tried Q&A type meetups where you come, you can sit down, have dinner with us, bring any of your questions. It's a free format, sort of stack overflow in person type thing where if you've got a question, there'll be somebody there who has the know-how to help you figure out the answer. This has also worked pretty well. 
And we're going to keep experimenting as much as we can with the ways that we try and do this. So, in my view, we have gone some of the way to making Open Tech School really open. But how can we make all of our open projects in whatever domain that they exist even better? If the main goal here is to bring more knowledge to more people, then I'd encourage you all to think about what open means in relation to open knowledge, open source, etc., and how you can make your work more accessible in every sense of the word. In what I'm about to say, I am focusing a lot on workshops and events here, but I think there are a lot of takeaways from this for all kinds of open projects. The first thing that we haven't done yet that I'd really like to try is to provide laptops for people who can't bring their own. This is one barrier to entry that we haven't been able to surmount yet, partly because we don't have any money, but we're trying to think of other ways to do this. But if somebody doesn't have their own laptop, if they've got a desktop at home or they have a laptop that they have to share with family members, they simply can't afford their own, which is the case for more people than you probably think. Um, they can't come to our workshops because they have no way of participating in them. I think that's really crap. I really like to be able to provide a, a small stable of laptops to, to people who want to turn up. Another thing is that we want to focus on ensuring that the venues that we use are accessible for mobility impaired participants. And this, is, this has typically been something that we have been able to achieve, but it's not something that we've advertised, which is an oversight, I think, on our part. I'd really love to have a, a common uh, norm of people advertising what kind of accessibility their venues offer and to think about whether people with mobility issues can use the facilities that you've, you've booked for the event. I, uh, in, in addition to the, the Reddit experiment, experimenting with advertising to different communities to make the idea of this more accessible to people outside of the usual circles is something that I, I want to push for a little more. Uh, this means working more closely with local councils to get lots of people involved there, indigenous groups if possible, and as many other groups as we can think of to let people know that this stuff is happening, even when they're not necessarily looking for it. So it's on their radar. And translation. I mentioned this before, but although we have it in a few different languages, I want this to include languages like Auslan, Australian Sign Language. One thing that I thought about was having interpreters at workshops, but in conversation with a few of my friends in the deaf community, it, uh, it was uh, brought to my attention that another thing that many hearing impaired people would really need or like is videos of all of our content being signed alongside the text because many of them would prefer to communicate or some of them would prefer to communicate in sign rather than reading large chunks of information. I don't think this is fair enough. And we should, we should really engage the community more about what they need in doing that so that they can take these, take these workshops home with them. Because we offer this to all of our regular attendees and we want these people to be regular attendees as well. Um, it would also be great, I think, to think more about uh, visually impaired participants. I haven't tried this, which is something I really should have done. Um, navigating our site with a screen reader, for instance, are we providing descriptions for the things that, for the, for the screenshots that we include? I'm not entirely sure that we are, and I'm thinking that every time that I start up another project, this should be the very first thing that I'm thinking of. How well is this set up, and how well can anybody take this material if we're truly trying to make it open? I think from what I've described above, it's, it, this is not enough. There are lots and lots and lots of factors that I haven't covered or that I simply haven't thought of because they're not on my radar, and I need to speak more widely and look more widely and do a lot more of these things. But whatever you do, whatever you're trying in your own endeavors, it's important to tell people that you're doing it because otherwise they're never going to know. <laughs> and advertising is one way of just making sure that you get that out there, whatever kind of accessibility that you're trying to include in your, in your project. I believe that we need to keep the accessibility focus central because we miss out on talented contributors to all of our projects every day that we don't do this. 
what we really need to do is get more people and more perspectives involved. The more that we have different perspectives from different people of all different walks of life informing the works that we do, the better and the stronger it's going to be. So while hopefully I've thrown a few more thoughts into the mix, I wanted to thank all of you truly and deeply. Um, as members of open communities everywhere for doing what you do, I think it's awesome and amazing and exactly what we need to be doing. I'm continually encouraged and inspired by every member of the open community um, to, 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 you know, to make the world as good as it can be. And I really want to bring as many people along with us all on that journey as I can. So thank you very much for having me here. Thanks, Lily. Um, we've got about uh, seven minutes for questions. Any questions? Um, this is more just in regards to you saying that you would like to have laptops as um, would, I'm sure I think was the best way, if um, an organization had laptops they were throwing out, that would probably be good for the cause, right? Yeah, or maybe. would there be logistical issues in that? Some logistical issues in the sense that uh, the organization structure of the Open Tech School here is kind of fluid. And we've got lots of people who get involved as they can, when they can, as tends to be the case with a lot of volunteer-based things. Um, I think if we had some kind of designated central repository, that would become a lot easier, and we can certainly think about that. But at the minute, we, we haven't got place for them. And this is something that I'd, I'd really like to try in future. Yeah, absolutely. Or otherwise, um, what is it, like Melbourne University, whatever, lending their um, like computer labs, for example? Yeah, that's a, really cool A local idea. uni or, or TAFE or something. Yeah, thank you. That's cool. I like it. Anyone else? If someone was interested in running some open tech school workshops or starting their own open tech school chapter in their town, what would you recommend they do? This um, is a plant question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, firstly, go to opentechschool.org. That's where we keep all of the information that you would need to get started. Um, you can speak to me. I'll be around this conference all week. Matt and Angus as well. Um, we've all had a hand in running the one here. There are lots of resources out there and lots of help that we can provide um, in terms of just putting bodies in a room. But generally speaking, it's just a matter of asking. Information is all there. We can, we can help you out. And we'd love to see that happen. Anyone else? I think, oh, wait, one more. How do you see the fit for your materials compared to uh, structures like EDX that are publishing kind of equivalent courses but for university level material? I think there's certainly some overlap. Um, we tend to aim our material mostly at, at adult learners rather than children, usually because there are so many people already cater catering to teaching children how to program that we feel like that niche is probably already well, well taken care of. Um, but generally speaking, it's, it's something that we, I suppose because it's built on the back of in-person workshops, that's, that's the main difference. Something like EDX, which is online, um, is great because anybody can connect to it from wherever they are. What we really like is to get a community of like-minded people together in the same room to encourage each other as they go to keep going with the workshop that they're learning. And, and to turn to each other and talk to each other. And we bake cookies usually, have a cookie, you know, that kind of thing, make a cup of tea and sit down and help each other out. So it's the face-to-face -face thing that we, we really like to instill. And I think that's the main difference. But the, it's, yeah, it's more social. Uh, but, the, but the online aspect is definitely there. And it's not like we couldn't go down that path as well if we wanted to. All the material is up there. Anyone can take it and use it and do what they want with it. So there's nothing to stop someone working through this at home. We just haven't advertised it that way. And we could, 
But um, the social aspect has been the backbone, generally, of, of what we've been trying. Hi, Lily. Hi. Um, do you ever have people coming to Open Tech School that are essentially there for professional development and probably should be out there paying for a, you know, a, a professional course? And if so, is that a bad thing or how would, how would you handle that? Not necessarily. Um, we don't tend to ask people why they turn up. We figure if they, they'll turn up if they want to turn up. Um, that's an interesting question. I like it. Um, it's not something that we've really run into. And I don't think, I don't have any problem personally with people using this material to help themselves professionally, personally, or whatever it is that they want to do with it. It's certainly not going to replace a two week intensive professional development course. Um, so if someone's looking to get that out of it, they probably won't. But the contacts that you can make at a, at a workshop and the kinds of people and projects you can get involved in to further that might be another alternative to paying thousands of dollars for, for a couple of weeks of courses. Either way, I don't think I don't think that anything any any one approach is better or worse. It's just what suits the individual. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Nothing else. Cool. Well, thank you, Lily.